I grew up in a family of four boys. I was number two out of four. And for whatever reason, most of the conflict that I experienced growing up was with my older brother, Eric. Um, my weapon of choice was psychological torture. Eric preferred using brute force. But one way or another, we would butt heads, we would get on each other's nerves, and sometimes one of us would get upset enough that we would go to my dad seeking justice. And that's where it really got interesting because instead of solving things for us, my dad would look at us and he would say, Eric, David, I want you to go into your room, just the two of you, and figure this out. I don't want to see either of you until you've worked this out. So we would slink off into one of our bedrooms, and at first, it was just icy silence. I would sit on one end of the room like this, my brother would sit on the other end of the room like this, and we would just kind of wait each other out. But after a while, um, one of us would start to crack, probably from sheer boredom, but we would start to talk again. And, and sometimes that first would be more yelling and more accusations and anger, but sooner or later there would be some form of apology, there would be at least some form of truce, and so we would look at each other and say, well, let's go talk to dad. So we would come back out and we would come to my dad and say, okay, dad, we worked it out, it was part his fault, it was part my fault, and we would go about our day. I am happy to tell you that today, many years later, my relationship with my brother Eric is really good. And I think both of us realize that the problems we had growing up were really mostly his fault. <laughs> so, why do I bring that up today? Well, we're spending six weeks talking about lockdown lessons. Things that, that God wants to teach us, that we have the opportunity to learn during this pandemic time that we might not be able to learn any other time. And it seems to me that one of the things that our Father in Heaven is doing during this lockdown is He's sending us off to our rooms with each other so we can get some things worked out. Because one of the things that I'm convinced we need to learn is how to make peace in our homes. So, eight weeks or so into the lockdown, let me ask you, how's the peace level in your home? And actually, before you answer that, let me just define what I mean by peace. Uh, because sometimes when you use that word, people just think you mean, you know, nobody's beating each other up. There's nobody screaming at each other, no fights going on, so we're at peace. But the biblical concept of peace is so much richer than that. You're, of, of course, familiar with the, the Old Testament term, the Hebrew term shalom, which is normally just translated peace, but, but it's much more than that. Because shalom is talking about a kind of relationship between people where there is mutual dependence, mutual support. It's a community where people are deeply involved in each other's lives, um, where they, they listen to each other, where they help each other with projects, where they respect each other, even if they might not agree with everything the other person says. It's talking about a community where um, if one person gets a job or makes the honor roll, the other people in that home are just as excited about it as the person who got the job or got the good grades. It's a community where when somebody loses a job or somebody um, has some, some uh, maybe a breakup from a boyfriend or a girlfriend, the other people in that home share that loss with them. And the person experiencing the loss actually feels it being shared by other people. So that's what shalom is. Um, biblical peace is so much more than just lack of fighting. So let me, let me just ask you again, what is the peace level like in your home? I really believe that God is using this period to send us to our rooms so we can learn how to be people who live at peace. And so this Mother's Day, let's talk about learning to make peace in our homes. I think I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, well, you know, I'm quarantining alone. <laughs> there are no other people in my home, so this really doesn't apply to me. But, but it really does because everything that we're going to be talking about today um, applies to all relationships. So even if you're, you're not sharing the same physical space, we all are in relationships with other people, and God calls us to live at peace with the people around us. So let's take a look at the passage together. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to kind of jump to a few places. So we're going to start in verses 1 through 4, and then verses 7 through 10, and then verses 12 to 14. 
all right? So Colossians 3, 1 to 4, 7 to 10, and 12 to 14. Hear the word of the Lord. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Then skip down to verse 7. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. And then verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. This is the word of God. So I want to look at this today under three headings, and and each of these headings, each point, is a phrase that I just lifted directly from the passage. So here here are the three headings. Set your mind, rid yourself, and clothe yourself. So if you really want to be a peacemaker in your home during this lockdown, there's something that you need to set your mind on, there's something you need to rid yourself of, and there's something you need to clothe yourself with. So first, set your mind. Look again at the first two verses, or first few verses, really. Verse one says, you have been raised with Christ. Wow. Verse three says, you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ. And verse four says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. There's a lot of theology in those verses, but here's the main point. If you are a believer, your deepest identity is not the family that you come from or the school that you attended or your wealth or the things that you've accomplished or even the the stupid mistakes that you've made. Your deepest identity, the thing that really makes you, you, is your connection with Christ. So Jesus redefines who you are at your core. And so Paul says, set your mind on that. Set your heart on that. Make that the way that you think about yourself. So the first step to being a peacemaker in your home is you have to start thinking about yourself in the right kind of way. I have this natural tendency to base my sense of self on what I have accomplished. And so If I have been working hard, if I've been diligently writing sermons and counseling people and, you know, leading the church and doing my doctoral studies, if I've been, you know, productive at home working on projects and, you know, making progress on my wife's honeydew list, which is quite a list, by the way, um, if, if I've been taking care of myself physically, eating well and exercising, in other words, all those things that are important to me, if I've been faithful in doing those things, I tend to feel good about myself, like, hey, I'm, I'm an okay person. On the other hand, if I've been slacking off, if I haven't been doing such a good job on those things, I tend to feel less valuable as a person. In other words, I have this tendency to set my mind on my performance. Um, and God is in the process of training me to set my mind on something much more stable than that. One of the main places that God trains me is in our daily morning meetings when I listen to his voice through scripture. And and let me just give you one recent example of that. I I see in my my journal on Friday, April 24th, uh, so it was about two weeks ago, my reading for the day was from the end of Luke chapter 3. So that's where I am just reading through the Bible. And so it's the passage where Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist right before he goes public with his ministry. And so it says that when Jesus came up out of the water, there was this voice from heaven that said, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. So I read that passage and I was was meditating on, on that scene 
And I realized something, that those words were spoken to Jesus before he did any public ministry. So he had not gone out and taught anyone yet. He had not healed anyone or really done, done anything. And yet the father was pleased with him simply because he was his son. And so in my journal, I wrote these words, identity, security, love, blessing. And I wrote what every child needs to hear. And so God was sort of modeling with his son what every parent should communicate to their kids, right? A love that, that is not dependent on the child's performance. And I thought about it some more, and, and I wrote this. And these are the words the Father speaks to us because we are in Christ. And, and as soon as I wrote that, I realized that was the thing that I was supposed to grab hold of that morning. Like that was God's word to me for, for, that, for that day. And so I transitioned into my prayer time, and you know, I prayed for all those things that I had on my list that day and the people that are on my list. But I always close my morning meetings with God by standing up and just intentionally receiving his blessing before I start my day. And so on this day, I don't remember the exact words, but I, I, I said something like this with, with arms open to receive his blessing. I said, Lord, thank you for this incredible truth that I am your beloved child in whom you're well pleased. God, today, would you help me to deeply believe that and live out of the fullness and the security of that place? And I just stood there for probably another 30 seconds, arms spread wide, to receive the blessing of my Father. And then I closed my my devotional time and I went on with my day, and I'm sure I did some things and accomplished some things that day, But here's the thing, I was not doing them or accomplishing them so that I could prove that I was worthy. I was doing them because I knew I already was, because I had set my mind on my father's love. Um, Some of you moms really need to hear this today because you have fallen into the trap of comparing yourself with other mothers. And it's just toxic. And so, you know, because of social media is good and bad, right? So here's the bad part. You're seeing all these moms in how they are homeschooling their kids during the lockdown and how they've got their kids all neatly, you know, drawing and, and doing their assignments at the table and how these moms are teaching their kids to sew and can fruit and memorize a Bible verse every day. Right? I mean, they've just got it all going on. And then you look at your own home and you just feel like an absolute loser. Um, here's what you need to hear. Listen carefully, moms. Your value is not dependent on your success as a mother. Let me just say that one more time. Your value does not depend on your successful mothering. You Listen, you are a beloved daughter of God. He says to you, you are my beloved daughter. In you, I am well pleased. Hear those words. And now go and from that security, go and enjoy being a mom. Set your mind on that. And I would say the same thing to all the non-moms out there. If you want to be a maker of peace in your home, the first thing you really need to do is to make some peace in your own heart. And, and that peace comes from the perfect love of the Father that is ours through Christ. Now, some of you might be listening to this, and this is just foreign to you. I mean, the idea of, of experiencing in your heart God's blessing on you like that is, is just, that's an unknown thing. And maybe, you know, you believe there's a God, maybe you grew up in a religious home, but it's never been personal for you. And, and for you, the next thing you need to do is to make it personal. And that's not something you need me to do. That's not something you need a church ritual to do, right? I mean, we do church rituals to, to acknowledge things, but where that, where that transaction really takes place is in your heart between you and God. Here's what you need to do. You need to look at the cross of Jesus Christ, remember what was done there, and just say in your own words, God, I believe that Jesus died for me, and I receive your forgiveness, and I receive your power now. You know, it says in John, in the Gospel of John, to those who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. And so maybe for you, the thing that's going to make Mother's Day 2020 really memorable is that it finally all became personal because that was the moment that you received Christ. Um, Set your mind on Christ. 
And then, from the security of that relationship, here's the second thing. Rid yourself. Rid yourself. Look at verse 8. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. What do all those things have in common? They're all relational things, right? They're all ways that we treat other people. I saw this really interesting uh, statistic uh, about a month ago. Um, They said that Walmart.com, where you can order things online through Walmart, they are selling tons of clothing ever since the lockdown. But here's the, the weird thing. It's, it's almost all tops. Like nobody's buying pants or skirts. Everybody's buying shirts. Why would that be? Well, because for a lot of people now, their life consists of sitting in front of a computer and, and taking part in video meetings, video conferencing for their job. So people only see them from the waist up. So Walmart is making a killing on shirts. But here's the problem. Those people who live in the house with you, they see all of you. They see the stained sweatpants that you're wearing. They see that pair of socks you haven't changed in four days. And they see the ugly parts of your personality, too. And so you know this. When you're in relationship with other people, and it's not always just putting your best side forward, when they see all of you, sometimes offenses take place. People say things that anger you or annoy you. Have you had any of those moments recently? I was meeting with my my men's group this last week, and we talked about how the lack of shalom, the lack of peace, sometimes has been showing up in their homes. And one of the guys who has young kids, he said, you know, in my house, there's such a delicate balance. There's all these things that have to be just right. So there's getting the kids going with their schoolwork, and there's keeping the house clean, and there's thinking about, you know, meals. And then my wife and I are both trying to do our work, you know, remotely from home, and one of us is in the kitchen with the kids, and one of us is in the, in the study. And then whose turn is it to go to the grocery store? And hey, who took my breathing mask that I had right there on the table to go to the... And he said, so many things have to be just right that if, it gets disru- if the balance gets disrupted, chaos breaks out. I thought that was a pretty good description of lack of shalom. Another guy in the group was a little more blunt. He said, you know, last week there was one day I came into my house and my wife was standing at the kitchen sink angrily washing dishes. Hey, married guys, have you ever seen your wife angrily washing dishes? It's not good when that happens. So he said, there she was angrily washing the dishes. And I came in and I asked her if I could help. And she said, I don't need your help in here. You just could do something with those kids. Um, that was a very non shalomi kind of situation going on in his house. We all know those moments, right? When you see the worst in people and something upsets you and you feel your pulse rise a little bit, right? And, and the natural part of you wants to do what? Look at verse 8. You want to show anger rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips, right? I mean, this is spot on. This was written like 2,000 years ago. It is so accurate. You want to lash out. Or some of you react in a different kind of way. Instead of attacking, your strategy is to withdraw. Last week, there was an article written by Aaron and Kelly Cerrone called Immunizing Your Marriage During COVID-19. And listen to what they said. It is so normal for two spouses to deal differently with stress, chaos, and uncertainty. Under duress, one becomes controlling, louder, and angry, while the other quickly grows withdrawn, silent, and irritable. One is hot anger, the other is cold anger. Neither is good. So maybe you're not the yell and scream type, but you have your ways to show anger, and those ways are just as destructive to the shalom in your home. So whatever your tendency is, here's the point. Because of your connection with Christ, you now have the power to act differently. You actually have the ability to diffuse the situation and be a catalyst for peace. Paul writes, rid yourselves of all such things as these. You can actually do that. One of the guys in my group used this great example. He said, you know, it's like, it's like you're the coach and you have these players on your team, they all represent you. And there's that old self that always wants to start a fight and he's always sitting on the bench going, put me in. He always wants to get back in the game. But you're the coach and you can actually say, you're gonna stay right there on the bench. 
What we're being told here is that because of the power of Christ, we can rid ourselves of those things. When you hear that voice telling you to attack or to withdraw in anger, you can choose instead to listen to the, bo- the voice of Jesus calling you to rise above it and be a peacemaker. So set your mind on Christ. Let God reprogram you every day to say, that's who I am. And then from that center, rid yourselves of those things that rob the peace from your home. And then, here's where it really gets exciting, clothe yourself. Clothe yourself. Let's reread verses 12 through 14. These are some of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. These are verses that several of our staff members have actually printed out and hanging in their office because we've leaned on these verses in our staff relationships. If you are wanting to find a short passage of the Bible to memorize that's really practical so that you'll have it handy when you need it, I can't think of a better passage to memorize than this. Colossians 3, verses 12 to 14, listen. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and Forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So you and I are being called to make a decision, to to take a certain action, right? It says, clothe yourself. Because there is this piece of clothing, let's just call it a shirt, not a Walmart shirt, and it's hanging in your closet. It did not used to be there before you knew Christ, but it's hanging there now. So back in verse 10, it talks about taking off the old self and putting on the new self. So this is a call to intentionally put on a different version of yourself, like you're taking off one shirt and you're putting on another. And, and the, the version of yourself that you're called to put on is the version of you that's supernaturally empowered by the Holy Spirit to do things, to react in ways that you could never do otherwise, to respond to annoying things and annoying people in a way that's far beyond your own ability. If you do not, if you leave on your, your old shirt, here's my promise, there will be no shalom in your home. I, there just won't, because that old self is a peace breaker, whether it's a loud, obnoxious peace breaker or whether it's a quiet, withdrawing peace breaker. That old part of you will bring lack of peace. But with this shirt on, you'll be amazed at what's possible. So these last few verses give us this vision of the kind of peace that's possible in your home. So as we move toward the close of this service, I want to invite you to imagine just, just think a little bit about what this could look like in your home. You know, if you look at the label on, on a shirt, um, it'll tell you like 60% cotton, you know, 20% polyester, you know, 10% rayon, whatever it is. This shirt that we're being invited to put on has five things on the label. Five things listed on the label. Here they are. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So let's paint a quick picture of your home with you wearing that shirt. So first, compassion. This is the Greek word splanknon, one of my favorite Greek words. It means literally guts or innards, but it came to mean an emotional connection in your guts that, that connects you with the suffering of other people. In the Gospels, many, time, many times it says Jesus saw certain people and he was moved with compassion. His guts were like twisting in him as he shared the pain of this, this other person. He felt like it was his own pain. So, so here's the picture. Guys, you walk into your house and your wife is angrily washing dishes at the sink and she barks some orders at you. So if you're like me, your natural inclination is, what, are you kidding me? I mean, do you want to know what kind of day I had? I mean, maybe I need a break. I don't deserve to be treated like this. I come in the house and you start yelling at me. This is ridiculous. That's what I naturally want to say, right? That's the old self talking. That's me wearing the old shirt. Anybody else wear that shirt sometimes? So let's let's rewind. Go back out the door. And let's, let's try this again. You walk in 
and your wife is angrily washing dishes and she barks orders at you and you feel this inclination to go back at her, but you catch yourself and you take this deep breath and you intentionally choose to take off your old self and put on your new. That all takes about a half a second, right? And I'm not talking about mind games. I'm talking about an actual change in your, in your disposition, in your demeanor, where you're opening yourself to the power of God, right? So this is, this is a Godward turn in your spirit to say, I'm going to put on my new self. And suddenly, you start to feel a glimmer of compassion for her. You begin to feel what her day must have been like. And even though it's true that you have the right to not be greeted like that at the door, right? You have the right to better treatment. You give up that right. Oh, what a powerful thing it can be when we give up our rights. And so instead of your heart hardening toward her, which it was beginning to do, you feel your heart beginning to get softer toward her. And when you can sense yourself responding in that way, it's so empowering to think, wait a minute, I can actually rise above this, that, that it, it, it builds your faith a little bit. You realize, God, you really are making me a different person. So you give her a quick kiss on the cheek, you run down to take care of the kids, and guess what? When you respond in that way, your wife's heart, which was pretty hard, begins to soften toward you as well. Because of your decision to take God at his word and put on your new self, peace has begun to flow into your home. Clothe yourself with compassion and with kindness. Those little acts of service that seem so insignificant, but they can change the whole trajectory of an entire day. So during the lockdown, most of my work is done in a shed in my backyard, you know, a man shed. It's actually pretty cool. It's, you know, it's private. I can really get some, some alone time back there. So on Thursday, when I was finishing up this message, I was back in my shed and my wife, Norma Jean, came by and we had a quick conversation at the shed door about the fire pit that I said I'd probably build in our yard, and yet I've been putting it, out, putting it off for a while. And the final words that we shared, the final conversation was something like this. She said to me, why don't you just pour some cement and get it started? And I said to her, why don't you pour some cement? Ah, marital bliss. So <laughs> I went back about my work, and about three minutes later, she texted me from the house on my phone, and the text said, hey, can I bring you some coffee or something? Kindness. And just like that, what could have been tension turned into a softness and peace between us. Clothe yourself with kindness and with humility. Um, humility is the polar opposite of pride. Because when you're clothed with pride, you get offended really easily. right? I mean, you take everything personally. You can't let things go. But when you put on the new self... It's like your focus moves off of yourself. I still love that old saying. Humility doesn't mean that you think less of yourself. It just means you think of yourself less. And, and it's, it's really true. So you stop keeping a record of wrongs. You stop keeping a record of rights. You stop saying things like, I emptied the dishwasher the last two days. It's your turn today. Um, it frees you from the prison of yourself, and that is a glorious freedom when you're not trapped in yourself. The more humble you are, the more shalom there will be in your home. So clothe yourself with humility. That, you've got that shirt. It's in your closet. And clothe yourself with gentleness. My favorite proverb, you've probably heard me talk about it, it's Proverbs 15, verse 1. Very simple. It says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So think for a minute about the power that puts into your hands, that when someone in your home is acting with wrath or with anger, you have the power to do one of two things, to throw gas on that fire, right, or to sprinkle water on that fire, all depending on the way that you respond. And, and when you have put on the new self and when you have moved your ego out of the way and you start feeling compassion for where that anger might be coming from and you speak words of gentleness, right? Baby, I'm so sorry you've had a hard day. 
as she's angrily washing the dishes. I, I want to hear about it later, but right now I'm going to go take care of the kids. And just like that, some of the anger just simmers down and peace flows in. Man, don't underestimate the power of gentleness. Clothe yourself with gentleness. And then finally, clothe yourself with patience. You know, throughout this lockdown, I cannot help but thinking all of us are getting this massive lesson in patience. It's like, it's like patience boot camp we're all going through, right? Um, it's like God is a, a potter who's molding and shaping the clay. He's molding and shaping us to be people who can persevere, who have endurance, who really have patience built into our character. And it seems like one of his strategies to do that is to send us to our room with other people and lock us in there for a while, just like my dad did, right? You guys go work it out. Either you'll kill each other or you'll find out how to get along. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. So verse 13 says, bear with each other. When that person in your home does something that's so annoying, right? Like he told me he was going to put the recycling out last night. And I look out the window and here comes the recycling truck and our cans aren't out there. I can't believe it. When you find yourself feeling like that, before you react, you put on the new self and you start to, to feel that short fuse that was about to detonate getting longer. And, and, and you realize that, you know what, you're not so perfect either, and you can be annoying sometimes. One of the guys in my group said, here's what it is to bear with people. Bearing with them means you put up with other people's stuff while they put up with your stuff. Very well said. Clothe yourself with patience. And by the way, sometimes when you're sharing a home, when you're sharing proximity, there are offenses that actually are too big to just bear with. I mean, let's be honest. Sometimes it's a real offense that needs to be addressed. It really has crossed the line. So when that happens, it says to forgive them, just as, by the way, God has forgiven you probably five or six times already today. So talk to the person about it, bring it to their attention, but at the end of the day, forgive them. Choose to let it go, because if you hold on to it, I'm telling you, it's going to hurt you more than it hurts them. So think about this. You have the ability to significantly increase the level of peace in your home. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking the problem in my home is not me. It's her. It's him. And you know what? Okay. We are very imperfect people, and it could be that you are sharing a home with some flagrant breakers of peace. That could be the case. But here's the thing. You're only responsible for yourself. So you, here's what you can choose to do. Set your mind on Christ. Allow God to retrain you that who you are is based on Christ and not anything else. Be centered on that every day. And then you can choose to rid yourself of those tendencies you have toward anger, whether it's a loud, boisterous anger or whether it's an icy, withdrawn, passive-aggressive anger. You have the ability to not put that player in the game. You can rid yourself of that only because of the power of Christ. And then you can choose to clothe yourself with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. When you do that, there will be peace that starts coming into your home. And it won't be perfect. It won't happen all the time. But I really believe when you get a little taste of that peace that comes in, man, you're just going to want more and more of that. Sometime in the future, and maybe it'll be in a few weeks. We're all kind of hoping for Memorial Day, right? <laughs> maybe it'll still be a few more months. We don't know. But this lockdown is going to end. And when that happens, there are some people who are going to emerge from this exactly like they were before, with all the same bad relational habits they had when it all started, but not you. You are going to be a person who walks out of this significantly better at relationships because you have used this time to learn to make peace in your home. Man, I can't wait to see that happen. I want to invite you to rise as we close our service today. Would you do that with us? Let's rise to our feet. 
And before we close in prayer, I just want to remind you of something that is really important this week. We are sponsoring this event this Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock, online event, um, which you can get to from thechapel.org or the same place these sermons are. It's called Together We Grieve. And this is an opportunity to come together no matter what kinds of losses you've experienced through these last couple of months. And, And we're realizing it is not good just to pretend those losses aren't there. So this is an opportunity to come together, to share those losses. There's going to be some teaching, some, some prayers, some songs helping us to, to look at those losses and to move on from them and learn from them. So I hope you can join us. Together we grieve this Wednesday evening. I think it's really going to be an important event. All right, would you join me as we close in prayer? Our Father, we are so thankful that you are in this time. And that it's not, it's not random, it's not meaningless, that you are teaching us through this. And so I pray specifically, Lord, that you would teach us through this time to be makers of peace. Lord, show us what it means to set our minds on Christ and find our identity there. Show us what it means, Lord, to rid ourselves of those things that just destroy peace and relationships. Give us the power to do that. And then, Lord, would you help us this week, today, to clothe ourselves with with humility, kindness, compassion, gentleness. Father, I pray that as we do those things, we would feel the peace flowing into our homes, that our faith would grow stronger, that the people around us would be blessed. God, would you help us this week to be makers of peace? We ask in the power, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. A very happy Mother's Day to everyone. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.